I'm going to take you through a bit of a journey. And uh, you have to stop me when time is up because I will not stop talking about this. It is so motivating, so inspirational, so fundamentally different and so satisfying to see that there is not only a positive future somewhere there. No, it's right here. It's with us right now. But I'm going to take you through the boring stuff first. The boring stuff is that in 91, I wrote my first article on zero emissions and zero waste. And it was published in Korea. And in 91, I was in the midst of creating my new business called eCover. And I felt that it was impossible to have a business that had waste or emissions. In 94, after I sold eCover, I was invited by the Japanese government and hosted by the United Nations University to actually design a business model based on the concept of no waste, no emissions. I mean, not reducing them. You just don't have them. And whatever you have, it's going to be a value for someone else somewhere. And so, to me, I don't like the debate about reducing emissions. You just don't have them. Period. No debate. What's all this stuff about 20% by 2020? In 96, when the university was coming, the university program in the Japanese budget was coming to an end, I decided to create the foundation. And that was to get done together with the United Nations Development Program. In the year 2000, I had the great opportunity to build the biggest bamboo structure ever in history. We built it in Hanover and we showcased seven cases of the new business model, two of which I'm presenting tonight as well. And the whole goal was to share to the world, we had, we had six million visitors to this bamboo pavilion. And I think we helped change the perspective of what bamboo was all about in the world. Guess what? That building was constructed with a German building permit. Now, any of you who's a construction engineer, the toughest ones in the world, you thought it was the Coastal Commission in California. <laughs> ah, they're so easy. In the year 2004, I initiated, on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of our launch of our initiative, Zero Emissions, we started a research program to really identify the best innovations inspired by ecosystems that we need to adopt. So what I'm presenting to you actually is a six-year research program. And first of all, there was a team of about 25 people headed by Janine Benius, who started feeding us all the information. They know the species, and we needed to have the raw data. So Janine and her team provided us the raw data. Then we took that information to the business strategists, the journalists, the financial journalists, the financiers, the VCs. And we asked them, if you look at all these innovations, where do you see the most innovative business models, competitive business models? Where do you see the greatest environmental breakthroughs? And most of all, most important of all, where do we generate most jobs? We have an economy today that is growing and doesn't generate jobs. That economy sucks. <laughs> Nothing less. Because in an economy that is not providing income to a majority of the growing youth of this world is an economy that is self-defeating. 2008, 2009, I went around the world and met in person most of the scientists, the entrepreneurs, the people who make it happen on the ground. Go out and see them. There's nothing like having a lunch with someone, spending a weekend with a team and understanding what drives them, what makes them tick. And April 2010, here we are. We present the book, The Blue Economy. And I think it's very important that we first and foremost say, why do we call this blue? Why not green? Well, if you look at the Earth from the universe, she is blue. And if you're looking at green and green only, then you're only relying on chlorophyll and you're only relying on trees. And ecosystems rely not only on trees and plants, they rely on five kingdoms. And the five kingdoms includes bacteria, that includes diatoms, that includes algae, fungi, animals, and of course plants. 
And so we have opted for the green, whereas actually the color should be a bit more all-encompassing in our blue sky and our blue ocean. They're very blue from looking from the outside. But then people started criticizing me and said, why are you, are you, you're undermining our whole debate about the green economy. You shouldn't be doing that to us. So I had to give him another story. <laughs> Who's wearing jeans these days? Can I see front row a couple of jeans? Yeah, you, that's indigo, right? That's a blue that's called indigo. You know how in ancient times you made blue? Because the original color pigment is green. And you know what chemistry was used to turn it blue? You peed on it. Urine is the chemical you need to convert green to blue. Well, we're going to talk about toilets, I guarantee you. <laughs> now, the green economy all too often depends on tax subsidies, taxes and subsidies. And it requires people to pay more and investors to be green angels and not expect returns. Well, excuse me, that doesn't work for the majority of the world. That only works for those who are rich enough so they can do that. But we need to involve the bottom of the pyramid. And the bottom of the pyramid requires you to install innovations that make it cheaper, easier. And we can't make it more expensive. And so if we believe that this world is a world for all, then it has to include the bottom of the pyramid. And so we have to have innovations that reach out, first and foremost, to the three billion where we are not capable of responding to their basic needs for water, for food, for shelter, for health, for energy, for education. And so to me, if the green relies on subsidies and taxes, that's not the economy that I want. I think we need another one. And I think we need one that goes beyond what I did. Sorry, that goes beyond what I did. And I'm sure in this audience, some people say, I still buy your product. And I have to say, I wish you don't. Because this initiative in 92, featured on CNN, whereby I have a factory that itself was biodegradable. The factory was biodegradable. The product was biodegradable. But what I didn't realize is that biodegradability has nothing to do with sustainability. Because I was cleaning up the rivers in Europe and even Americans were importing it from Europe and using it here in America. But I was destroying the rainforest. And I didn't know unintended consequences that I did not realize. And I didn't want. And I destroyed the habit of orangutan. And I was an environmental hero. I got the United Nations Award for building that factory while I was destroying the habit of orangutan. I mean, hey, they should have put me in prison when I went to Indonesia. And, and I think this is part of where I really had a hard stop. Doing less bad is bad. We have to do more good. Isn't it simple as an ethical question? And we're not doing it. And why aren't we doing it? Because we're not able to imagine a competitive business model that responds to the needs of all with what we have. Now, this is a very simple difference that we have to put in our minds. We have to work with what we have. We know already we're consuming more than our Earth can produce. And we, we see the footprint studies and we just keep on going on. And so instead of saying, you can do this, you can do that, you can do so, what I want to know is what can I do? What inspires me to do? And I have realized over these years that we cannot expect big business to do it. And many of us, we've known that big business will not do it. Not because they don't want to do it, it's because they can't do it. America, you're the nation that exported the MBA. That means core business, core competence, supply chain management, and whatever comes out of that straitjacket is not going to be considered. I'll give you examples later on.